Tourism in Paxton Hall. So if, it's going to be about a 15-minute video about the program, and then there will be a time for questions and answers led by our class leaders, Melissa and Brad Kohler. The regular classes will be started on February 9th, so if you're wondering if this program is for you, we invite you to stop by next Sunday. Our worship under the stars will be held Friday night, February 7th at Wiscachetta Retreat Center. We'll leave the church at 6 p.m. and then we'll be back right about 9.30 or a little bit earlier. There will be a light dinner and then worship and music led by Emmy Lanson and, Paul and, and her fiance Paul. And there will be s'mores by the fire. We hope that you'll join us for this time of food, fun, and fellowship, and of course, worship. At this time, I'm gonna invite Melinda Losey to come up and speak to us about our opportunities for service. Good morning. Um, this today is Opportunities for Service Sunday. Uh, last week we handed out our Opportunities for Service booklets uh, in church and so I hope you had a chance to take those home and take a look at them. If you did not get a booklet and you still need one, if you will raise your hand and the ushers will bring by a booklet and a pen for you. Um, so you can go ahead and raise your hands if you need one and um, we will pick these up or Actually, we won't pick them up. You're going to bring them forward at the end of service uh, when we have our baptism renewal uh, um, as part of worship towards the end of the service. So um, I'd ask that you please make sure that you have marked down any current ministries you're involved in that you want to stay involved in and also any new ones. Uh, and also be sure and fill out the contact information completely so that we can update our records uh, in the church office. Over the next month, you'll be contacted by the ministry chair in charge of the area that you have volunteered to work in, and they will contact you letting, letting you know that they've gotten your card and they will start getting you involved in that ministry. Um, I'd also encourage if you're visiting the church, you don't have to be a member to get involved in ministry here. So if you've been visiting the church and you want to start getting involved, it's a great way to meet people and, and kind of start really getting involved in ministry. We cannot do ministry without you. Uh, I told you that last week. As a body of Christ, we have to all work together uh, in the ways we've chosen to make a difference in our world, to give hope, to help provide for basic needs like food, clothing, and shelter, to show love and compassion to our neighbors locally and globally. And we help our church by volunteering in worship and study, to reach out to the community, to care and maintain our church campus, to reach out to our shut-ins and care center residents, and so much more. The clergy, myself, and our ministry chairs, thank you in advance for the commitment you're making today. Thank you. Thank you, Melinda. I'm reminded of the psalm that says, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. As Colin comes forward to light our Christ candle, let us open with a word of prayer. Gracious God, we are glad to be in your house this day. We are so thankful to worship and to lift high your name. We ask that we can lift up your name with joy in our hearts and with energy, just filling our souls so that your praises can be sung. I ask these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Reverend Katie. Uh, let's stand to our feet together and and greet your friends or someone next to you, or if you see someone you don't recognize, greet them and welcome them here this morning. We definitely want you all to lift your voices this morning as we begin to worship and sing these songs of praise and thanksgiving today. This song echoes the sentiment that Reverend Katie just told us about. Uh, it says, sing for joy. I have joy this morning. I'm so glad to be alive. I'm glad to be in the house of God. I'm glad to be with you all. Let's sing this song together and lift our voices as we declare the goodness of our God. Let's sing it together. If, 
if we call to him, he will answer us. If we run to him, he would run to us. If we lift our hands, he would lift us up. Come and praise his name, all ye saints of God. Sing for joy. Sing for joy to God. Let's sing this next song together. We know it here at First United. All the people said amen. Sing it together. You are not. You are not alone. If you are alone. When you feel afraid.
be seated in God's presence at this time. Children, it's time for your children's message with Miss Ann Corville. Miss Ann is our uh, uh, <laughs> head of our children's <laughs> ministry. <laughs> and my brain is not on. This morning, whoo, as I looked out over there, I can remember some of you when you were running over here, and now you're sitting with the youth all tired. <laughs> well, I'm going to get you some of those in just a minute. Would you like to hold a pack for me? Why don't you hold a pack right there? You hold that for me. Okay. Well, boys and girls, you know what I brought with me today? Hmm, that's right. And do you know that this can store all kind of information on it? If we went and stuck it in the CD player, it could just store all kind of, we could hear maybe some music play or somebody talking. It would have all kind of information. Well, do you know that... You have something that's kind of a computer, just all built in. Do you know what it is? That's right. Good, Betty. Well, you know, when you take information in and you store it up here, then maybe five days goes by, and then all of a sudden you need some of that information do you know that God told us to store his word, to store his word so we could fight against evil? And do you know what he means by that? He means that you really need to study the Bible and read his word and memorize it and keep it in your head. And when problems come your way, then you can say, oh, I know what God wants me to do. I can remember that. So remember that you're just like a computer. You can store all kind of things up. And when you do, 
you will know what to do when things happen. So boys and girls, let's come to Sunday school this year. You know, it's not going to be but a few more weeks and we're going to have a contest. (gasps) And they're going to be telling you more about that contest and I can't wait. And it's going to be how many of us are going to be in Sunday school. So let's be sure and come and join our friends and learn God's word. Let's bow our heads. Dear Lord, we just thank you for your word. And Lord, let us stand firm on it. Let us learn your word and let us know that you always are in control. Amen. Okay, here we go. Thank you, Miss Ann, for that uh, reminder that we are to keep God's right. word in our hearts. And, you know, speaking of the word of God, I love it when we sing songs that are are scripture based and this is one that we're going to sing this morning that reminds us that God considers us a friend and we are joint heirs with Christ when we decide to and choose to believe in him and accept the fact that he has adopted us into God's family as a friend Let him play. Oh. 
Everybody say it. Let's go to God in prayer right now in this moment. Lord, I thank you for your son Jesus and that he gave his life just for us. Lord, I thank you for your love this morning. I thank you for your peace and the joy that knowing you brings, that no matter what we're facing, no matter the test, no matter the situation, that we serve a God who is mighty and all-powerful, and he knows just what we need. And, Lord, we can go to you with confidence because you call us a friend. We are children of God. And, Lord, we thank you right now this morning for your grace and for that right to go to you with whatever we need. All that we ask, we know that you will answer. And we trust you, and we thank you, and we pray to you as your son Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. Let's stand to our feet. We're going to sing another song this morning that we know here at First United that reminds us to take a moment to breathe. Sometimes life gets a little too fast, and it gets a little ahead of us, but we can go to God and rest in his presence. Screaming, bad feet at the floor. Gets off to the races, everybody at the door. I'm feeling like I'm falling behind. It's a crazy life. 90 miles an hour, going fast as I can. Try to push a little harder, try to get the upper hand. So much to do in so little time. It's a crazy life. Sing it out! It's ready, set, go. It's another wild day. Start to fall apart in my heart. I feel you say, just breathe, just breathe. Come and rest at my feet. And breathe, just be chaos cause, but all you really need is to just breathe. Cup of Joe just to get me through the day. Wanna make the most of time, but I feel it slip away. I wonder if there's something more to this crazy life. I'm busy, 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 and it's no surprise to see that I only have time for me, me, me. There's gotta be something more to this crazy life. Yeah, I'm hanging on tight. It's another wild day. Starts to fall apart In my heart I feel you say Just breathe Just breathe Come and rest At my feet And I hear the Lord saying Just You can just be Chaos cause But all you really need Breathe. 
that's all you really Our scripture this morning comes from 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 through 8. Now, brothers and sisters, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you, which you received and on which you have taken your stand. By this gospel you are saved, if you hold firmly to the word that I preached to you. Otherwise, you have believed in vain. For what I received, I pass on to you as of first importance— that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, that is Peter, and then to the other twelve. After saying that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers and sisters at the same time, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, and last of all, he appeared to me also, as to one abnormally born. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I want to say how much I appreciate our youth being here. They had a lock-in last night, so that means they were up all night long here at the church, and they're all in church this morning. So um, Allison and Glenn... um, And uh, all of those who are uh, helping out, Emily, all those who are helping out with the youth, we really appreciate their hard work and them being present in church this morning. Questions are so important. It's a healthy thing to ask questions. It's an especially good thing to ask questions about our faith. So for several weeks, we are considering questions that people ask about our faith in a skeptical age. A couple of weeks ago, the first one was, how can I believe in a God that I can't prove? Last Sunday morning was, why is there suffering and evil? And now this morning, did the resurrection of Jesus really happen? The bottom line question is this, does Christianity have a solid historical basis? Is there enough evidence for the resurrection of Christ that's convincing and compelling? I want to say at the very beginning that this question that we're asking this morning is of the greatest importance. If somebody today could disprove the resurrection of Jesus Christ, then Christianity would be destroyed forever. If the body of Jesus somehow were discovered somewhere and they would find his bones, then that would mean that Christianity is invalid. It's not true. That's what the Apostle Paul said in our scripture reading for today in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Paul said, if Christ has not been raised, then your faith is in vain. So our question today that we're wrestling with is of the greatest importance. Did the resurrection of Jesus really happen? Was it a myth? Now just to be clear, I'm talking about a real resurrection. I'm not talking about a spiritual resurrection, that the spirit of Jesus, after his death, kept on living in the hearts of those who've loved him. I'm talking about the actual, living, literal, physical resurrection of Jesus from the grave. Now, he talked about his resurrection over and over again before it happened. All through the Gospels, he talked about his death that was coming, and he always said, and three days later, I will rise again. Here's an example. Mark chapter 8, verse 31. Jesus said, The Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed, and after three days, rise again. So here's the question to ask this morning. What is the evidence? How can we know? I'm quoting now from a good book that I recently read entitled Reliable Truth by Richard M. Simmons III. Here's what he said in his book. We know more about Jesus' burial than any other person in all of ancient history, more than any Old Testament character, more than any king of Babylon, more than any philosopher of Greece, and more than any triumphant Caesar. We know who took him down from the cross and bore him to his tomb, and we know where the tomb was, and we know who owned it. So here are the facts of history that we know. 
Jesus was crucified. That's a fact of history. He was buried. That's a fact of history. Three days later, the tomb was empty, and his followers claimed to have seen him alive once again. Facts of history. That was the beginning of the Christian church. And I'll say it again. Our faith today stands or it falls on the resurrection of Christ from the dead. Now, to me personally, as I think about this subject, there are three main historical facts that point to its truth. And a sheet of papers in your bulletin if you want to jot these down and keep track of them. Here they are. The empty tomb on Sunday morning, the appearances of Jesus after his death to so many people, and the transformation of his disciples from cowards to preachers of the gospel. So an answer has to be given for those three things. Why did they happen, and what's the explanation? Here's the first question. Why was the tomb of Jesus on Easter Sunday morning empty? What happened to the body of Jesus? Or did he really rise from the dead, as he predicted? Why was the tomb empty on that first Sunday morning? I want us to consider this morning some possible theories about that empty tomb that have been suggested and argued over the years. First of all, some people over the years have claimed that it was all a, a big fraud. According to them, the tomb was not empty, but here's what happened according to them. The women on that Sunday morning got up real early and they went to the wrong tomb. Sometimes they claim that the body of Jesus was stolen, and that's why the tomb was empty. So I want us to think about this fraud theory and see if it's possible. Is it possible that the women went to the wrong tomb on Easter Sunday morning? Now, personally, I kind of laugh at that. If by some strange chance, even though they saw where he was buried, and even though they were present at his burial, even though the women might have gone to the wrong tomb on Easter Sunday morning, then they ran back to tell the disciples that he was alive, and you're telling me that the disciples then went to the wrong tomb also? Then they informed the Jewish authorities, and you're, you're telling me that the Jewish authorities then all went to the wrong tomb? The resurrection of Jesus was preached in Jerusalem just a few days after the crucifixion, and yet nobody thought to go to the right tomb. I just find that to be beyond credibility. If somebody had produced the body of Jesus, it would have killed Christianity before it ever was started. So I have a pretty good question to ask those who promote this theory. Why didn't the enemies of Jesus produce the body of Jesus? Here are the early Christians in Jerusalem saying, he's alive, he rose from the grave. Why didn't the enemies of Jesus produce the bones, produce the body of Jesus and say, he's not alive, here he is, he's dead. Had they done that, that would have killed Christianity. The reason they didn't produce the body of Jesus is because they couldn't find the body of Jesus. There was no body of Jesus to be found. He, the, the tomb was empty. It was nowhere to be found. The whole world could see that the tomb was empty. And the question is, why is that? How do we account for the fact that the tomb of Jesus was empty on that Easter Sunday morning? Now, I've heard people say, well, maybe the disciples stole the body of Jesus. Maybe they stole it. I have to remind us that the Jewish authorities and the Romans did everything possible to keep that from happening. In fact, his grave was guarded by Roman soldiers or a Jewish temple guard. A large stone was blocking the entrance to the tomb, probably weighing between one and two tons. So here's what those disciples would have to do to steal the body. They would have to overcome the Roman guard and move the stone and break the Roman seal on the tomb, which was punishable by death, do all of that without anyone seeing or hearing anything in the middle of the night, and don't forget that those disciples at this point were scared to death. They were off hiding behind closed doors. And here's the main kicker that makes me say, no way, that didn't happen. Of those 11 disciples, 10 of them died for their faith. 
I'm quoting now from Alex McFarland in his book. He wrote, the Christian martyrs of the first century did not die for an idea or a promise. They died because they were eyewitnesses to the resurrected Jesus. If Jesus' body was stolen, which we've already shown was not only unlikely but impossible, then his disciples would have all eventually died for something they knew was not true. With the exception of John, his disciples each endured horrific deaths. They were separately crucified, boiled in a vat, and subject to other tortures and horrific ends. No sane person would willingly endure such torment to publicly validate a lie which he had created. So I asked the question, were those disciples crazy? Were they deluded? Look at those guys. They wrote, they traveled and preached all over the world, they spoke to large groups and they spoke to small groups. There's no hint of them being deluded in any way. To me, there's no question about it. Those men and women were sane, but they were changed. In a matter of days, they went from being cowards to being bold preachers of the gospel because of what they had seen. Now, how can that be explained if they stole the body? Not a single disciple ever changed his story. Not one. Every one of those guys was willing to die for the truth that Jesus rose from the grave. Simon Greenleaf was the founder of Harvard Law School. He had one of the greatest legal minds in American history. He spent a lot of time investigating the resurrection of Christ. Here's what he said after his long investigation was over, and I'm quoting now. It was therefore impossible that his disciples could have persisted in affirming the truths they have narrated had not Jesus actually risen from the dead, and had they not known this fact as certainly as they knew any other fact. Then he finished by saying, the resurrection of Christ is the most verifiable fact of ancient history. So that's the first question in my mind that has to be answered. Three days after the crucifixion, the tomb of Jesus was empty. That's a fact. The question is, how do you explain that fact? A second important fact that has to be accounted for is the large number of people who claim to see Jesus alive once again after the crucifixion. After his death, he appeared to Mary Magdalene. He appeared to the other women. He appeared to Simon Peter and to John. He appeared to his disciples without Thomas present. He appeared to his disciples with Thomas present. He appeared to seven disciples by the Sea of Galilee, and he cooked breakfast for them. In our scripture reading for today, probably the oldest part of the New Testament that Reverend Katie read a moment ago, the Apostle Paul said in the year 56 AD that Jesus Christ appeared to at least 500 other people, most of whom were still alive at the time of the writing. So today, let's take those 500 eyewitnesses who saw Jesus alive after his death and burial, and let's put all of those in a courtroom. If each one of those 500 people were to testify for only six minutes, including cross-examination, that would be an amazing 50 hours of firsthand testimony. 50 hours of testimony. That would have to be the largest and the most lopsided trial in all of history. I ask again, how can that be explained away? Now, for some people over the years, and it's quite a stretch, here's the explanation. According to them, Jesus didn't really die on the cross. He swooned on the cross. He was on the cross, and he fainted from exhaustion and blood loss. Everybody thought he was dead, but he really wasn't. I want us to see and to understand how, how really crazy that is. They want us to believe this. He went through seven trials. He was beaten by the guards. He was given 39 lashes that tore his body to shreds with a cat of nine tails. He was so weak that he couldn't even carry his own cross to the place of execution. And then he was crucified the most brutal means of execution in the history of the world. Nobody ever survived a crucifixion. He was on the cross for six hours. 
then he was certified as being dead by the Roman guard. But just to be certain of that, a spear was thrust into his side, and blood and water flowed out, which is a sure sign of death. After that, he was wrapped in a hundred pounds of spices, put inside a tomb with a large stone rolled across the entrance, guarded by soldiers. But according to this theory, he didn't really die. He survived all that. And then he freed himself from all that spice wrappings, a hundred pounds of it, and then he rolled away the stone, he got by the guards, and then he appeared to his disciples as the Lord of life and the conqueror of death. That, to me, is beyond credibility. German theologian David Frederick Strauss, who is not a Christian, by the way, said this. He said, it is impossible that a man who sneaked half dead out of the grave, who crept about weak and ill, needing medical treatment, who needed bandaging, strengthening, and indulgence, could have given to his disciples the impression that he was a conqueror over death and the grave and the prince of life, an impression which lay at the bottom of their future ministry. And something else. How do you explain away over 500 eyewitnesses? I've heard people claim over the years that it was mass hallucination. Here's what they say, the followers of Jesus wanted so badly to believe in him that they imagined, they hallucinated that he was alive again. But it's important to point out that he appeared not only to believers, he also appeared to unbelievers. He appeared to his brother James who didn't believe in him. He appeared to Saul of Tarsus. And then there's no such thing as mass hallucination. You know that, right? There's no such thing as mass hallucination. I might hallucinate something, and you might hallucinate something, but we don't both hallucinate the same thing at the same time. And for sure, all of us here today don't hallucinate the same thing at the same time. So the question has to be answered. How do you explain the appearances of Jesus to so many people after his death? In the book of Acts, chapter 2, Simon Peter is preaching after the crucifixion to hundreds of people in Jerusalem, and here's what he said. God has raised this very Jesus from the dead, and we are all witnesses of this fact. And a third important fact that has to be accounted for is the transformation of his disciples. How in the world did that happen? They went from being cowards in the Garden of Gethsemane on Thursday night to bold proclaimers of the gospel just a few days later. We have to ask the question, what happened? What changed and transformed those men and women from hiding behind locked doors to going out in the streets of Jerusalem and saying, Jesus is alive. He is who he claimed to be. How do you answer that? To me, there's only one answer. They believed with all their heart, that Jesus was alive and they had seen him. So our question for today is this. Did the resurrection of Jesus really happen? Is there evidence for it? To me, three things have to be accounted for. The empty tomb, the appearances of Jesus to so many people, and the transformation of his disciples. A famous missionary in South America told about going to visit a tribe of Indians who lived on the bank of a river. They were all suffering from a terrible disease and they were dying by the dozens every day. There was a hospital on the other side of the river that offered to give them help and healing for their disease, but they were afraid to cross that river because they believed the river was inhabited by demons and devils and they would die if they do so. So the missionary went down to the banks of the river and he touched the water and he said, the water is not going to hurt anybody. Look, I'm touching the water. He said, the water is not going to hurt anybody. I crossed this river to come here. It's not going to hurt you. Come with me to the other side. They wouldn't do it. They were afraid of the river. Here's what he finally did. He turned around and he faced the river and he dove head first into the river under the water and he swam under the surface all the way to the other side and he got out and he punched his fist in the air and he cheered and all of the Indians on that side 
cheered for him, and then they followed him to the hospital and to help. 2,000 years ago, that is what Jesus did for us. He plunged into the river of death, and he came out on the other side. He is who he claimed to be, and that makes all the difference in the world. Let us pray. Lord, thank you for giving us the freedom to ask tough questions. We thank you, Lord, that history, scripture, and our own personal lives points to the truth that three days after the crucifixion, Jesus came back to life. He is who he claimed to be. Lord, help us this day to hold on to that truth with all of our heart. In Christ's holy name, amen. We affirm our faith now through the words of the Apostles' Creed. Let us stand as we do so. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he arose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. And please be seated as the ushers come to receive the morning offering.
this morning we come to a special time in the life of our church the Sunday that we have the opportunity to renew our baptismal vows as you know in the United Methodist Church we baptize folks who desire to be baptized by either immersion or sprinkling or pouring but it's only done one time a person's only baptized one time and so we have opportunities to renew our baptismal covenant and we do that this particular Sunday as we close in just a minute, I'm going to give to you the opportunity, those of you who would like to do this, to come to the front as you feel led and touch the water and then touch your head. And by doing so, say, I renew my baptism this day in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And those of you who have opportunity for service cards, this is your opportunity and your chance to turn in that opportunity of service card. And there are baskets up front. The two go, to web, go together so well. We renew our baptism and we say, I'm going to put my baptism and my faith to work here at this church. And this is how I'm doing so. Let's have a word of prayer and then I'll invite those of you who would like to come forward and renew your baptism to do so. Lord, may this be a holy time in our lives. I pray that you will challenge us and strengthen us and lead us to a new commitment and faith in Christ this day as our baptism is reaffirmed through Christ our Lord. So I invite you now, as you feel led, to come forward and touch the water and give thanks to God for your baptism.
Would you please stand? Next week in worship, we will be continuing our challenging questions in the skeptical age with the message, is Jesus the only way to heaven? As you go forth from this place, think about it. Did Jesus Christ really rise from the dead? If you believe so, tell everyone.